station to promise outstanding content, but when it's time to deliver, they fall flat on their ridiculous faces. Enter LA Talk Radio. You are listening to the most original talk radio station anywhere. We are LA Talk Radio at latalkradio.com. You're listening to The Bruce Montalvo Show, right here on L.A. Talk Radio. Hello, thank you for joining me on my first live on-air broadcast of The Bruce Montalvo Show here on L.A. Talk Radio. It's November 11th, 2012, and on today's broadcast, I have a very special guest joining me. I will be conducting an exclusive interview with acclaimed actor, writer, and director, Enrique Castillo, who is instantly recognized for his appearance in the Los Angeles gang cult classic film, Blood In, Blood Out, directed by Taylor Hackford, who produced La Bamba, also starring Damien Chapa, Jesse Borrego, Benjamin Bratt, Billy Bob Thornton, just to name a few who co-star in the film. Now, Enrique plays the role of the revolutionary-minded Hispanic prison gang leader, Montana, the head of the prison clique known as La Onda, in this fictional drama based on real-life accounts written by Jimmy Santiago Baca and again directed by Taylor Hackford. Now, parts of this film were actually filmed in San Quentin, California, just minutes north of San Francisco. Again, this film is a fictional account of real events that took place in the 1970s through 1980s and adequately categorizes the rise of power of the Hispanic prison gangs in California state prison systems. Now, he has been a star of both the silver screen and television, ladies and gentlemen, since the 1970s, starring alongside such actors as Anthony Hopkins, Denzel Washington, and Jack Nicholson. Outside of film, he has worked with the Eugene A. Obregón Medal of Honor Foundation, which further solidifies this man's credibility as a true Latino patriot by helping raise funds to build a monument at Olvera Street in Los Angeles, California, in commemoration of those Medal of Honor recipients. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce acclaimed actor, writer, and director Enrique Castillo to our broadcast. Thank you very much, Enrique, for uh, joining me today. Well, it's a pleasure to be on the air with you, Bruce, on uh, on the Veterans Day, uh, to remember those in our families and across the country that have served our nation. Thank you for thank you again. Now, um, it's only fitting, Enrique, that I ask you about your award-winning play "Veteranos: A Legacy of Valor," a tribute to four Latino Congressional Medal of Honor recipients, being that, like you said, it's Veterans Day. And words alone can't even begin to express what these patriots have done for the American citizenry. It is truly a day of remembrance for those brave men who made the ultimate sacrifice to preserve our Bill of Rights and the Constitution. Now, Enrique, can you tell our audience about your tribute to those four Latino Medal of Honor recipients, your play titled Veteranos, A Legacy of Valor? Well, um I uh, I wrote it, uh, this was prior to 9-11, so it was in 2000, and I did two national tours of it in 2000 and 2004. Uh, it's a story of four young recipients from four different wars, from World War One, World War Two, Korea, and Vietnam. Uh, and, that, and it features the, um, the dances of the period, the music of the period, uh, with a live band on stage, and it's bilingual, very much like our cultural representation is. Um, we premiered it here in Los Angeles, and uh, it was actually on the birthday, the 90th birthday of the mother of Eugene Obregón. Wow. Uh, so we had a birthday cake for her to celebrate her birthday and also to honor her son's memory. We had uh, four, I believe, uh, Latino Medal of Honor recipients still living at the time that joined us were very instrumental in supporting the production and all across the United States as we toured it and I made sure that 
we toured the production to the cities where the four young men uh, had been from, including Laredo, Texas, Houston, Texas, um, and uh, East Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. So the families and the the um, the citizens of the towns could pay uh, much deserved tribute to their citizens, their local citizens, who had, as Roy Benavides so aptly put it, gave up all of their tomorrows so we could enjoy our todays. Exactly. Um, very honored to have the families there witness it and give us their seal of approval. Uh, some of them are still living. Some of them, you know, were awarded the medal posthumously. Obviously, to see a Medal of Honor recipient actually walking around is like basically watching a dead person walking and should be dead, considering the act of valor that it takes to be awarded the medal. Exactly. So it's uh, it's a, it was a real honor uh, to have um, done the production and to have it received so well by the Latino community and really all all communities to understand that these were stories that are American stories. They don't specifically uh, refer to one particular ethnic group. These are American citizens and some of them who actually became citizens through the military uh, to preserve the liberties that we enjoy. So uh, it was a real honor. Um, the cultural aspect of the of the production included, as I said, the language, which is bilingual, uh, the songs, uh, specifically Registro de 1918 was a number that was sung by the Mexicano soldiers mm-hmm. leaving from Laredo, Texas, and uh, bidding goodbye to their families in the town of Laredo. Um, and the other cultural aspect was that the in in keeping with the warrior legacy of our culture, uh, the narrator throughout the piece was an Aztec warrior, which was representative of, of Huitzilopochtli, who is the god of war in Aztec mythology. So it was uh, it was extremely entertaining for everybody, while it was also very inspirational and educational and that's one of the things that we made sure to do was to create a an educational component with the production that uh, would make sure that students could attend the production and so that uh, particularly Latino students in those cities that had a large demographic uh, come to see the production so that they could see the sacrifices and the contributions by those people of their culture and within their own families, their parents, their their uh, uncles, their sisters, their mothers, you know, who have, have contributed so much to this country. Exactly. It also included a, a, an epilogue which uh, briefly commemorates the the uh, history and the contribution of Latinos in America's defense from the American Revolution, which many people really don't don't know because it's a uh, it's not a focus of history books uh, to portray that aspect of our contribution to the country. Uh, absolutely. I mean, it, it's got to be more than just getting an interchange named for a Eugene A. Obregón. I mean, they have to, I mean, I was never, being Mexican-American myself, I was never uh, aware of Eugene A. Obregón until I drove down the, the, the 101, <laughs> you know what I mean? Right, right. Yeah, there's uh, uh, there, there there's there is a several locations that are named in honor of of recipients that are Latino. There are mm-hmm. Navy ships that are named after them. Uh, yeah, interchanges and and uh, and highways and whatnot. Uh, and and as we travel through, we read them or we see them, but very very few times do any of us really take the time to do the research and find out what the contribution was, who these people were. Many of them could be our neighbors, and uh, many of them could be within our own families. And we often don't spend the time. Prior to 9-11, um, most of us, even with our own families, never really turned to our fellow uh, fellow, fellow family members who ha- had served or were serving or are serving and say simply thank you. Exactly. And in my interaction with uh, veteranos and, uh, and also those that serve, 
that's all they ask for is at least acknowledge it and and don't forget uh, the contribution that we've made uh, so that you can enjoy the privileges that you that you have exactly um, I was fortunate enough to play military heroes in on television I was the only, probably the only Chicano or Latino ever on the Waltons uh, playing a war hero from World War II. And uh, certainly on stage, I, pay, I played several, several roles honoring the contribution by Latinos in the military. And so through my experience with my family and, and interacting with people of my community and with colleagues, many of us would always wonder, well, when is it going to be our representation? Why does it have to be simply a name that is said within the context of Saving Private Ryan or any other yeah, film. Yeah. And then when those films may be produced, as in uh, uh, From Hell to Eternity, I think it's called the story of, of uh, Guy Gavaldon in the 50s or 60s, a hero from World War II that was portrayed by Jeffrey Hunter, who was an Anglo, uh, but never really revealed that he was a Chicano that grew up amongst uh, Japanese in, in uh, Little Tokyo, understood the language, and that that was uh, was very helpful in his survival and his and his having received a, a recognition for his acts of valor in the Pacific during World War II as a Marine. And there are many, many stories like that, including um, Escuadron 201 from Mexico that flew uh, missions during World War II in the Pacific exactly. and has yet to be recognized by the American government. So there are, as I said, there are many, many stories, and trying to do the production of Veteranos uh, was not enough. Exactly. I tried to include as many stories as I could, but we have over 200 years of history. As I said, it goes back to the American Revolution, um, including the Medal of Honor, which was established during the Civil War. Uh, there were f three, four Latinos in the, in the Civil War, many, many of us who know, supposedly study and know American history, never bother to really research and understand what our true contribution is to the country. We know about George Washington, John Thomas Jefferson, yeah. and the French participation, but never stop to wonder, well, why is Galveston, Texas named that? Well, it's for Bernardo de Galvez, a um, you know, Latino hero oh. from the American Revolution as the governor general of Louisiana during that period and had a multi-ethnic uh, army that was fighting without gringos uh, to help the 13 colonies. Wow. So if, were it not for that participation by Puerto Ricanos, Cubanos, Mexicanos, Indios, Negros, and Españoles, yeah. there might not be a United States. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's definitely information that they don't want to teach the students nowadays. <laughs> well, that becomes, uh, again, that, that, that becomes our responsibility. Exactly. If nobody's going to do it for us, then we have to do it ourselves. You know? Absolutely. And, and I, that was the primary motivation for, for veteranos is uh, if, you know, and many times when they do produce something like that, uh, we're, we're very dissatisfied because of the portrayal or the casting or the way it's written. Um, and so why not do it ourselves? We're the ones from the cultural group we're the ones that know the stories and we're the ones that know the nuances of the culture and we're capable of doing it so let's just do it and that's what i did hey it was an excellent production i i have to tell you it's great i saw the video on youtube i wish i could go see it is it still playing uh, or if it is uh, could you let our listeners know where where they might be able to catch veteranos a legacy of valor well, it is not being produced at the moment. Uh, part of the production was actually filmed by the History Channel and included as part of their documentary, uh, Hispanics and the Medal of Honor. But um, I've had many, many requests to remount the production. Mm -hmm. uh, I've gotten emails from across the country, people that were actually able to see it and have told their friends, and so I get emails requesting the production to be remounted. So within our busy schedule, yeah, we, we'd love to do it again. Uh, we often talk about it, and uh, uh, friends, obviously, around here that are, that are, I still 
interact with who are veterans or in the military have requested it. And so we, it's just a question of making it a priority um, and then uh, and then finding the funding for it. Obviously, you can't do it without funding. It, it is a somewhat expensive production because of all the elements involved, uh, on top of which if, if you're going to tour it. So um, it would just be a matter of uh, getting getting the producers involved and actively pursuing the funding for it. But, yeah, the, 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 it's always the right time to do it. Uh, I don't have to wait for Veterans Day or Memorial Day. Exactly. This is something that could be done at any time, anywhere, um, considering the, uh, the amount of representation that Latinos have in the military. And I think that it's the best way to, to show your appreciation is to just just bring them home advocate for bringing them home i mean uh, right yeah absolutely absolutely i mean one of the, one of the one of the downsides of having to do a production like this is obviously the reason you do it is considering how many people have lost their lives in conflicts with one another amongst nations or individuals the fact that I even have to write something like that is somewhat depressing to me because of what it means. Yeah. It means that these young men who are Latinos, very much like my sons or my daughters or many of us in our families, had to actually go into conflict and sacrifice their lives. Yeah. And that's not something that I would wish on anyone. I have never met anyone who is more anti-war than someone who has been in war. Uh, many of them have told me that. Would they want to do it again? Of course not. Nobody wants that. So the fact that we have to do these kinds of reduction is, is, is it's, it's such a melancholy feeling, you know. But, but if it's going to be done, then let's do it with dignity, with uh, the honor that it deserves, and the respect, and, and the simple thank you that, that it merits from, from all of us. Exactly, and the the tradition aspect as well, like you said. Uh, now, um, I want to now I want to ask you. Moving on, <laughs> I want to ask you about uh, the role you played uh, in Showtime, where you play uh, Cesar in the hit TV series uh, Weeds, uh, where you were casted alongside Demian Berchir. I hope I said it right. <laughs> who plays uh, Esteban Reyes, mayor of Tijuana, Mexico? in seasons four and five of Showtime's hit TV series, Weeds. Now, uh, you were basically his right-hand man, Enrique, his bodyguard. Uh, what can you tell our listening audience about your experience with the CBS-owned network Showtime and the cast of Weeds? Well, it was, it was, a, it was a great experience. It was, it was difficult at times only because of my character and how he appeared. Uh, in contrast to the situations that that uh, the production reflects, which is, it's a dark comedy, yeah. and many of the people were very extremely talented from a comedic standpoint, and so I was in I was involved in in many scenes that were extremely humorous, but I could not laugh or smile, and it w- it was difficult in that respect. But of course, you know you have to. You, the professional, you, you have to work the role. Yeah. Uh, but I saw, I, I, it was difficult in that respect. In that respect, but extremely enjoyable. Everybody was uh, was uh, brought their A game to the production, from the casting directors to you know the costumers to everybody, um, and it was a, a very enjoyable experience with everyone. Everyone got along. Um, there was there I never saw any conflicts on the set. Uh, everyone was extremely prepared. Everyone loved their roles. Uh, it was a very enjoyable situation all in all. And of course, I loved working with Demian, who has now been nominated for an Oscar for a beautiful life. Uh, so he's extremely talented, a consummate professional, and a terrifically nice guy that that was the best part of it is it's He's a really good man, um, so it was a it was extreme pleasure to work with him. I'd met his his brother in Mexico, Bruno, so he comes from a, a family uh, of entertainers in Mexico that that understand the profession, they understand the craft, and uh, they conduct themselves accordingly. 
So it was it was an extreme pleasure and honor to be working alongside him. Um, and uh, from the from the standpoint of the characters themselves and what they represent, which many of us who are socially conscious kind of reflect negatively on our culture. These these yeah. the, the the mayor is and and all the people, including myself, are criminals. Uh, and the, and if you see the trajectory of my career, you will not see that many characters on my resume. And that is for a very specific reason. Number one, I've always come from a, from a standpoint of being socially conscious, particularly when it comes to my culture. And uh, I was also part of the uh, El Teatro Campesino, which we always try to reflect a positive aspect of our cultural struggle, whether it be from the military standpoint or uh, the farm worker standpoint. I grew up as a farm worker in my, my family were migrant workers. And so I'd always refrain from even auditioning for roles that reflected a negative aspect of our community. Uh, and so for, for quite a while in my career, I didn't do that. Uh, and especially because I had young children, and I did not want them to have to go to explain to their peers uh, that their daddy was the rapist or the drug dealer in a production that they saw on television, because I know that many times the public cannot separate the character from the actor. Yeah. And so once they were grown and understood that it, this was a craft, and I was not the way I portrayed characters, Thank goodness that I was able to exist long enough, you know, on the work that I got. But I was able to sleep a lot better, and I still do. So the, and the, the other um, saving grace about the production and the character of Cesar is because everybody in the production, including the Anglo characters, were all questionable characters, <laughs> including the lead. <laughs> so so uh, we were all in the same pot, <laughs> Definitely, and that, that was a that 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 was helpful. You had some great scenes there between you and Demian. I mean, just the overall excellent performance in Weeds, Enrique. Well, it was you know it's uh, again you know I, it always begins with the writing, uh, and I have to hand it to the writers. They were very open to suggestions. They knew that we understood the Latino culture better than they do, uh, so they were willing to learn and collaborate. Um, I shared uh, the the uh, background that I had created for and and characters that I was using as a model for for Cesar, uh, and it was received with uh, with a lot of appreciation and op open mindedness. Um, so it was enjoyable in that respect. So it was never a well, you know, just do it as I write it, and uh, that, that your motivation is your paycheck. It was never anything like that at all. Mm -hmm. And, of course, uh, Genji Kohan, the creator's uh, vision, uh, was reflected also in that, uh, and her person was reflected in the production because she's extremely open to collaboration, very creative, and a very nice lady. And so the, the entire production from crew and everybody it just reflects her personality. Okay. Now, uh, Enrique, I want to ask you about uh, uh, the bid out there to decriminalize marijuana cannabis, you know, entirely, and the recent bills out there that have just passed in Washington and Colorado, where the citizenry can now possess up to an ounce of cannabis and can partake of the plant recreationally without fear of being incarcerated. Your thoughts? Well, uh, since it was a measure, uh, on, uh, a it became a political issue. Uh, there's one thing that that I that I uh, oh that I insist on is whatever I vote for in a in a in a in the polling booth, mm -hmm. I never reveal. There's no I don't understand why you would have a private cubicle with a ballot that you mark without your name on it, for no one to be able to read and judge you by it, why then would I come out into the public and reflect what I just did? Yeah. I've never understood that. I take that very seriously. Even my wife does not know who and what I vote for. Mm -hmm. That's between me and my conscience. 
However, if we want to discuss the issues, yeah. it's been part of a cultural experience for more than just Latinos from a medicinal standpoint to a uh, holistic one. Uh, so, so I think the issue has to be revisited from a much more comprehensive standpoint than just to say, oh, it's for recreational purposes, so it's no harm done. Well, that's what they say about social drinking, and look what happens. You end up with your face, you know, wrapped around your steering wheel because someone was not responsible enough to know how to handle it. Yeah. So, you know, if you're going to discuss the issue, you have to discuss it, discuss it honestly, truthfully, and rationally without just simply saying, well, it's just for recreational purposes. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, nothing is really just that. It's not that simple as much as any other issue that comes before the electorate. It's not just a black and white situation. So I'm all in favor of discussing it. Um, it was part of my past, in my history, in my youth. And so, sure, as an experience, I do understand the impairment that it caused in me from a physical standpoint. So for me to be able to say, oh, I, it's like somebody saying, well, I'm a social drinker or uh, I can fu I'm, a, I'm a functioning alcoholic. <laughs> yeah, you know, I've heard that. I've heard that. It's, just, it's just a rationale for some people to be able to eventually abuse a situation and claim, well, you know, it's just a personal issue. No, I'm sorry, you know, when, when you're doing it in public or even in private, that doesn't mean you're going to keep it private. You can simply step out of your house, get in your car, and move on. And if you're drunk, you're going to take somebody's life, possibly. Yeah. So... You know, that there's two, There's a lot of issues to discuss, but I'm glad that it's out there for discussion. Exactly. Now, Enrique, um, you wrote a novel with a supernatural twist. Now, uh, can you share the details of that novel with our listening audience? Uh, well, the, the it was originally a screenplay that's titled Valley of the Dead, which is the original name of... Uh, of the Imperial Valley, uh, around where the Salton Sea is. So all of the action takes place in that county, in Imperial County. Oh. Uh, the protagonist is a... Uh, there are a lot of cultural elements to it. There's a mythological element. And um, the, the, the characters on either side of that spectrum are very deliberately named. Sometimes I inter interchange genders for the characters. Say, for example, the lead protagonist, his name is Gabe Luna. Uh, and there's, there's also a kind of uh, duality involved in that, the cultural aspect, which is Judeo-Christian versus, or, or contrasted to indigenous philosophy, you know, and duality. Um, and so the character of the lead protagonist is named Gabe Luna. Gabe, from a religious perspective, being the patron saint of communication, St. Mm -hmm. Gabriel, who the character then has become very uncommunicative. Mm -hmm. So that's the duality within him. His last name is Luna, which is traditionally associated with the female aspect, but he's a male. And then one of his allies, her name is Daylight Savings Time Begins Today. That's her name. Okay. And, uh, uh, and, and her name is being Daylight, which is reflective of the sun, is more often associated as a male. Mm -hmm. And so the genders are transposed there. Uh, one of his other allies, his name is Angel Nava. He's a deputy. Uh, and so his his name is Angel, but then Nava is 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 indicative of Navaja, uh -huh. which is you know yeah, knife, <laughs> uh, which is an avenging angel. <laughs> okay. And so there there are those kinds of elements involved. The the lead protagonist is a, a Chicano sheriff who uh, at a at a early age uh, uh, lost lost tragically lost his family and an infant son to a, um, a criminal, a, high, uh, a carjacker, 
And as a result of feeling responsible for it, he self-imposes himself in that uh, that environment, this hellish environment in a in a little two-building remote desert town called Comal del Diablo. Okay. So essentially, he's put himself in a purgatory, and he spends the the rest of his life there trying to track down the criminal that that caused the the demise of his family. Uh, and he interacts with his allies and, and uh, antagonists there. The lead antagonist is a, an Anglo border patrolman, and he has his criminal elements and partners that uh, they call him El Loco, which, uh, which uh, obviously you know, is, is close to Loki, which is the, the Norse god of, of uh, mischief. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of his partners is named uh, Arnold Benson, and Arnold being you know, the, the revolutionary uh, uh, traitor. Um, and then he has he, they're, they're, these two border patrolmen are, are partnered with a with a, uh, a Chicano coyote, uh, who actually is an American citizen, but as a result of his criminal activity in the United States, was forced to flee into Mexico uh, with family there, and and that's where he conducts his his um, uh, activities with along with the border patrol. Their their interests uh, primarily are 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 financial, uh, but then they they involve their a violent uh, situation that invokes the 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 animas of of um, all of the violence towards women that has occurred along the border mm-hmm. to Latinas. Uh, these animas uh, eventually. Uh, not just in recent past, but in, in ancient times, all the history of violence against women throughout uh, Mesoamerican history converge, and they they possess uh, this one young mother that is victimized by these negative elements, and through her they begin to exact revenge on uh, on these individuals, start tracking them down, and that sheriff actually begins, uh, his story begins in, uh, in the Otay Mesa up by Hakumba in a high uh, 4,000 foot elevation, but because of his criminal activity, which he's never really been prosecuted for, they, the Border Patrol is forced to uh, transfer him into the Imperial Valley, so basically they're sending him to purgatory. Wow. Um, and, and then those, those two elements there, the, the the good and the evil converge, and that's where the story takes place. Wow, that sounds like a very interesting book. Uh, when is it scheduled to be well, released? I hope so. <laughs> oh, I, I'll read it, and I'll, I'll advocate for it to be read, Enrique. <laughs> but uh, where, uh, where, where, when is it going to be released? Well, uh, where it is, it's uh, just before I, just before I, uh, I had finished the film in Texas, and then I, I, I was actually actually able to take uh, like two months off, and then uh, focus on it, and finally finished it, and then I was able to uh, do a a rewrite and chapter break just before I went on this last project to the Dominican Republic. Oh, I was going to ask so, you. So um, yeah. I sent it to. It's with an agent right now, literary agent. Uh, that's uh, going to read it and then uh, and give me the feedback. I have sent it to uh, to uh, uh, very few people whom I know, uh, but I have not gotten their feedback either yet. So you know, I, I understand people uh, have their lives to live, and uh, it's not one of their priorities. So, but uh, certainly, it's, uh, we'll see what the what the agent uh, what the feedback from the agent is, and then we'll see. But uh, I've been encouraged for other by other friends who are authors to consider. Self-publishing through uh, you know uh, several several means, including Amazon and uh, iUniverse and whatnot. So, uh, but I want to wait and see what this agent says, and then and then I'll go from there. Excellent. Now I did want to ask you about uh, your uh, the the project you just finished filming, "Kill the Dictator," where oh. uh, you spent a month in La República Dominicana, the Dominican Republic. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, um, 
Well, first of all, I, I, I'd never been to uh, the Republic of Dominicana, and being there, it was awesome. I mean, it was, <laughs> I could imagine. Uh, from, from, from a temperature perspective, you know, uh, I left the desert for a reason. <laughs> I grew up in the desert. I grew up in Imperial Valley so, as a farm worker, so I know what it's like to, to spend, uh, you know, working days in, in extreme heat. Uh, and so in, in the Dominican Republic, obviously, you know, it's, it's also uh, extremely hot and, and also very humid. And two of my least desirable experiences, but, uh, but very helpful towards using it as a motivation within the story, because that's where it took place. It, it, it's, it's a story of the assassination of uh, Rafael Trujillo, who was the dictator of the Dominican Republic, he was assassinated on May 30th in 1961, uh, and I play his right-hand man, who was the head of the scene, which is uh, Servicio de Inteligencia Militar. Okay. And this was a very ruthless individual who, who basically is very infamous in, in Dominican history as uh, a person who use every means of torture conceivable to to control the population. Uh, they rode roughshod over the country uh, to their whatever whims, you know, was blowing in the wind. And uh, uh, they were they were rapidly anti-communist, uh, but to such a degree that even the American government uh, conspired to have him removed and, and, and possibly uh, assassinated. However, it was done by a, a cadre of concerned citizens within the Dominican Republic that that uh, galvanized and uh, and eventually uh, were able to terminate his his uh, dictatorship. Wow, that's that's excellent. Now, uh... so it's a true it's a true to life story. Um, I was I I don't uh, I don't usually look at dailies or whatnot. I, mm. I put a lot of trust in the director. And, and the project, but I was able to see the setup of, of shots from a uh, cinematographer's perspective, and it, it looked it looked awesome, particularly because you got to remember that the Dominican Republic is where Columbus was, and 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 so a lot of the buildings are 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 extremely uh, ancient there. They go yeah. back to that period. And some of the stone that was used in some of the buildings is still there. Now, you know, we went and toured also the, the house where Columbus supposedly lived, which was still intact. And you're walking on these streets and, and cobblestones from the period, um, from, from a historical perspective, it's, it's, it's awesome. And then, of course, we're working in the basically the White House of the Dominican Republic, where, where Trujillo walked around, and Johnny Abbas, the character that I played, uh, where they conducted their, their affairs and had meetings about what they were going to do to assassinate bishops from the Catholic Church. Wow. And, uh, you know, from that perspective, it, it was really, it was really um, uh, rewarding. And, and, and uh, it, was, it, was a real, uh, it was a real enjoyable experience professionally and, you know, culturally. Okay. So many of people were, I mean, they just, they worked their tails off. I, I, I got to say that. I was very, very impressed with the effort that they put out. I never heard a complaint, considering the weather that they were working in on a daily basis. Um, they, they were consummate professionals. Yes, the learning curve is somewhat different from what we're accustomed to here in the United States. Uh, we have more, more of a history and, and certainly more financing for it. But in terms of uh, the, the human, the, the, the sweat equity that they put into it um, and, and make do with, with what they have, uh, well, you've got to be impressed by all of that. And it's really helpful to them and to the film industry for the former president to have carried the torch for the new film incentive law that, that was signed at, and is now in effect that is going to allow for not just Dominican filmmakers, but anyone who has a production to be able to come to the Dominican Republic and take advantage of that tax incentive and create more work, not just for ourselves, but also for all of the Dominican people 
so that they can have continued careers in entertainment. Exactly. Now, um, I want to ask you about uh, your character uh, in Blood In, Blood Out, Montana, who had a Shakespearean-like fall from power in the movie. He was writing a book in jail. Can you give our listeners an inside scoop into Montana's book? Well, it it, uh, it it was called a Chicano in prison, uh, and, and uh, there actually is a book uh, that we that we were that we were uh, given copies of also that had been written and was primarily from a you got to remember the period at the time and how these guys were able to gain the power that they did uh, was because of the language. But they weren't able to figure it out before because they were they were trying to figure out what's going on with these guys and how are they gaining this power and what are they doing, and so they used to send in psychologists and psychiatrists and whatnot to talk to these guys and try to find out. Well, you know, this guy's not going to talk to anybody. So eventually, what happened was this anthropologist went in there and basically was able to observe the conduct and figured out that a lot of it was based on the language and the a lot of it is eye contact, the way the communication was. And so this person who is used to seeing, studying from, a, from an anthropological perspective was able to gather all of that information and determine that these guys were conducting a lot of their business in a, in a language that was not understood by the prison administration in front of guards that were not Spanish speakers. Um, so uh, that anthropologist wrote a book uh, that I, th I believe it's called the, the, the Chicano Prisoner or the Chicano in Prison, and so that became the model of what Montana was writing. But, but what we discuss, being uh, Taylor Hackford, the director, myself, and Jimmy Santiago Baca, who, by the way, is not just the screenwriter for Blood In, Blood Out, but he's also a, an amazing poet, uh, very well established, and won multiple uh, American Book Awards for his poetry. And to hear him read is just so inspiring. But but anyway, we would we we would discuss uh, the contents of that book, and of course, uh, it was out of concern for the disproportionate amount of representation by specifically uh, our cultural demographic in the prison system, and what we needed to do to counteract that. In other words, we need more lawyers to keep. Uh, Latinos out of prison rather than more cops to put them in prison. Exactly. Um, and, and education, of course, is was was uh, was fundamental. That that needed to happen, and and so that is why uh, Montana uh, admonishes Miklo for for having failed his parole hearing and uh, insists that he educate himself and and hopefully become a beacon of hope for those on the outside. Unfortunately, he did the reverse. Um, but it was it was a matter of Montana ruling from a position of wisdom and integrity, and and uh, Mikla ruling eventually from a position of fear, um, which contrasted the two. And also, of course, you know the the I don't know if if m most people may or may not catch it that during the uh, that killing. Uh, montage towards the end that Miklo orchestrates, a very deliberate shot of him turning his head towards camera, and you can clearly see the enhanced blue eyes of the character uh, that kind of tells you, you know, that, uh, that where historically many civilizations have been conquered by those eyes uh, to a degree where uh, the phrase, the sun never sets on the English empire, was uh you know <laughs> that's where it came from that's where it came from wow. um now uh, so those those elements are, are what uh what what we had discussed and what probably would be included in the book yeah well uh enrique i want to ask you uh about your uh role in nixon 1995 uh nixon 
uh, starring Anthony Hopkins and his portrayal of the notoriously corrupt 37th president of the United States, Richard Milhouse Nixon, which is personally why I am a libertarian. <laughs> I read about this guy and uh, uh, his fall from the presidency uh, as a result of the Watergate scandal June of 1972. Now, uh, you played one of the White House plumbers in that film, Virgilio Gonzalez. Uh, can you tell our listening audience about the film and what it was like working with legendary director Oliver Stone? Yeah, you know, uh, uh, I had I had gone in uh, to meet with Oliver on a previous project. Uh, he was doing, he was going to do the Noriega story, uh, another dictator, the dictator of Panama, uh, who had been, uh, you know, uh, collaborating with uh, the CIA at one time. And we all have seen that picture with him and 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 George Bush Sr. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so uh, we met at that, at that, at that time, uh, and then uh, I got a call that, that he wanted me to work on, on Nixon um, as Virgilio, and uh, well, I jumped at the opportunity. I'd always wanted to work with Oliver. I have great respect for him uh, from a pro- professional standpoint and the fact that he, he had volunteered uh, to serve in Vietnam. Um, so I have a lot of respect for him. For that, uh, and also because it was an opportunity to again work with Ed Harris, Ed Harris, uh, who played I think he played Liddy, and uh, we had actually uh, made our first film together, a project called Borderline with Charles Bronson, and, wow. and we we played uh, a couple of coyotes there. Um, so it was it was uh, it was it was terrific, you know. I, I played you know Cuban and. Uh, um, so as as a as a as a cultural group, yeah. you know, we uh, we we were a Puerto Rican, and I, I was Chicano, and and uh, somebody else was a, a Cuban, and so we had several Latino uh, nationalities there, you know, all collaborating to to portray these plumbers. Uh, and yes, you know, uh, alongside with Anthony Hopkins and playing our president, who you know, as you see, many individuals who are well intentioned but somehow their personal shortcomings end up getting involved and derailing whatever good they could have done which is very very unfortunate it happens to everyone not just republicans it happens to democrats also well, uh, it hap- this has happened historically you know well i wanted to um, ask you about uh one of the white house plumbers actually uh frank sturges i don't know who plays frank sturges in uh oliver stone's film uh but um basically the fact that he was an elite member of uh operation 40 an elite hit squad that consisted of cuban refugees at the time who were angry with the castro dictatorship and were operating clandestinely uh under the leadership of nixon uh, under during the Eisenhower administration to assassinate Castro. So I, I think your character, Virgilio Gonzalez and Oliver Stone's Nixon, was there to uh, at the d- during the Watergate scandal. He was there to find documents that would link Nixon to the Bay of Pigs. Your thoughts? Well, I mean, uh, I don't I don't think there's any denying now. That, you know, you, you obviously know the information. A lot of it has been declassified. Thank goodness that it that it does. Uh, again, you know, a lot of well-intentioned people that that for whatever, either selfish, political, or or psychological reasons, end up uh, end up committing crimes that violate even the tenets that they stand for. Uh, however, that that element, which is, which was what the plumbers represented and what they were willing to do, is in stark contrast to what has been developing in Florida, particularly with the results of this last election. Yeah. When you see the younger generation, who has now is far removed from from that period of history that they are not as rabid uh, um, from one side, let's say, you know, right-wing extremism, that, uh, that now they're able to see things, the, this younger generation, with a much clearer perspective of who they are and where they are, that, that that's a period of history that doesn't really need to be revisited. 
Oh. Uh, it, it it hasn't happened. Uh, the overthrow of the of the of the government in Cuba has not happened. It hasn't happened for a reason because legally they can't do it, right? Yeah. You know, Kennedy said they can't do it anymore. So that has been a standing uh, rule for from the administration to administration. Situations are always evolving and changing. So you see a different perspective now from what was going on at the time. Absolutely. And that goes across the board, even from the military who were in Vietnam. I have a lot of veterano friends who are Latino and some that are not that are returning to Vietnam. They have a totally renewed sense of perspective. And you realize it's like from a personal level, let's say in, in your past you have a conflict with an individual, and many times it in the heat of the moment, it's very, very important to you. But then years later, you run into each other and you realize, what was that all about, you know? Yeah. It's like it, it's no longer that meaningful, so much so that you have to dehumanize each other in order to what? Make you feel better? <laughs> it, it, so, so portraying a character from that era... I cannot look at the character like the character that I just played in this in this film, Kill the Dictator, who is probably one of the worst human beings that I've ever had to portray, even to Montana, who is the head of a prison gang, and then Cesar, who is the right-hand man to the top drug dealer in Tijuana. I cannot look at these people, these characters, and say they're bad guys. Yeah. These are family men who have a personal perspective that sometimes become like-minded with other individuals, and they galvanize, and they feed off of their frenzy sometimes, and then their personal shortcomings can factor in, become misguided, and commit acts that totally violate the tenets that they stand for. At one time, well-intentioned, maybe but then totally distorted, and they end up doing things like Nixon did, which is very, very tragic, exactly. not totally unnecessary. Well, and, and so uh, we're finding that out right now as a result of this last, last election, where now you hear even on the talk shows, wow, they're talking so much about the Latino yeah. from both perspectives. And also they're talking about, wow, what a novel idea, compromise. You know? Yeah, we're we're and starting so, to get the recognition that we deserve now in America. I mean, you, I I want to honor the veterans, obviously who it's Veterans Day. That if it wasn't for their sacrifice, uh, Mexican Americans like myself wouldn't be on the radio today. Uh, absolutely. Veterans like Ismael uh, Villegas from where I'm from in uh, Casablanca, Riverside, California. Um, again, Eugene A. Obregón, Rudy Hernandez, all these veterans who, who, uh, who I wasn't taught, taught about, and I'm a Chicano, so I had to grow up and try to learn, uh, you know, on my own account about my, uh, my, uh, my culture, and it's definitely more rewarding when you go out there and you, uh, learn your own culture on your own terms. Well, Mr. Castillo, unfortunately, we're out of time. I would like to thank you for joining me on my first official broadcast here with LA Talk Radio, and I look forward to uh, many other exclusive inter interviews with you in the near future. Thank you for joining me today. Well, it was my pleasure, and I uh, congratulate you, and I wish you much continued success, Bruce. Thank you. Thank you. That was Enrique Castillo. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I am Bruce Montalvo. Be sure to listen to us Sundays, 12 noon Pacific Standard Time here on LA Talk Radio. And as always, I'm Bruce Montalvo reminding you that the freedom of the press is our right and our responsibility. Thank you. You're listening to The Bruce Montalvo Show right here on LA Talk Radio. 